Today, the gospel is from Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 28. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and then be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Lord, forbid it. This shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block for me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. I want to talk with you today and share some thoughts about human things and divine things. My paternal grandfather was in his 80s when he told me he was ready to die. My human inclination was to do what Peter did. But I listened to him. He told me his, his wife, my grandmother, had died six years earlier, and his friends had died. He said he'd had a full, successful life, done all he wanted, traveled around the world. He'd done what he needed to do in this life. I suggest to you, when people talk about their death, listen to them. It's both a divine and a human thing that they're sharing with you. A loved one may speak to you or me about his or her death. Our inclination may be to do or say what Peter said to Jesus. God forbid you die. Let's not, let's not talk about that. Peter loved Jesus. So when Jesus, a healthy young man, spoke of his pending death, especially the way in which he was going to die, Peter pleaded to God, God forbid this should ever happen to you. He wanted Jesus to stop talking that way. Jesus, let's change the subject. Let's not go down that path. Now, as a follower, and disciple of Jesus, Peter intuitively may have realized that Jesus' future was also his future. Maya Angelou, a great poet of our time, wrote, I'm grateful to have been loved and be able to love, because that liberates. Love liberates. It doesn't just hold, that's ego. Love liberates. It doesn't bind. Peter wanted to bind Jesus. We know that Jesus also loved and respected Peter. He wanted to liberate him as he wants to liberate us through his sacrificial love. In the passage before today's scripture, Jesus gave Peter his name, the rock, upon which the church was built, gave him even the key, keys to the kingdom of heaven, the ability to offer forgiveness. Jesus, ident or Jesus was identified by Peter as the Messiah, the Christ, 
the son of the living God. And yet to today, very short time later, there appears to be a fly in the ointment. Peter asked Jesus to change the course of his mission. Jesus then called him Satan. It seems Peter the Rock had some growing to do. And that for Jesus became a very teachable moment. He said, you, Peter, are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. And that's quite understandable because Peter loved Jesus. Yet, how can our love for our lives or our love for others or our love for the world possibly be a stumbling block for God's plans? How do we differentiate divine things from human things, the sacred from the secular? Jesus wasn't deprecating or depreciating human things when he responded to Peter. No, he was differentiating the human things from the divine and spiritual things. After we all, we know and we believe that Jesus was fully human and fully divine. God chose to reveal who God is by becoming incarnate in the flesh, by taking human form and substance. What's challenging about Jesus' comment is that our love, like Peter's for him, can actually be a stumbling block for us and others to God's love. Another way to put this is human love may not be divine love. Let me explain, since the English language is somewhat limited in its ability to describe love. Basically, biblically and in the Greek language, there are three types of love. Eros, which is physical, sexual love. There's philos, brotherly and sisterly love, as in Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. And thirdly, there is agape, self-giving, sacrificial, divine love. Peter's comment was rooted in philos, based on love for a friend. He did not want to let go of his friendship with Christ. He wanted to bind Jesus, hold on to him, yet to do that would derail Jesus' mission. What would he do without Jesus there? Jesus had become like a brother to him. He couldn't imagine his life without him. So Peter did a very human thing, and Jesus saw it for what it was. It was selfish human love. That's a transient thing, not a divine, self-giving, eternal love. The selfish love of Peter, his wanting Jesus to live on as his friend and teacher, is a most human trait. Don't leave me now, Jesus, he might have thought. I finally know who you are. When we're inclined to hold on to life tightly for fear of losing it, our own life or someone else's, we are in dangerous territory. We've all been where G Peter was, I think, when it comes to denying death, either our own or those we love. Yet Jesus taught Peter that it's only in letting go, giving away our lives, that we can follow and attain eternal life. Jesus said, for those who want to save their life, will lose it. Those who lose their life, for my sake, will save it. Curiously enough, when we pick up our cross and follow Jesus, we live with one foot in this world and one foot in eternity, the human and the divine. The human and the divine are bound together in the cross.
When I was a boy, I helped my dad plant hundreds and hundreds of trees. Seedlings he bought from the U.S. Forestry Service plant a, a tree today, and as it grows, it absorbs carbon dioxide, the waste product of our breathing, and it produces what we need for life, oxygen. The planting of the seedling is a human thing to do. What happens after that seems more a divine, spiritual thing. A small sacrifice produces a result that supports life now and in the future beyond our time. According to the Arbor Day Foundation, a mature leafy tree produces as much oxygen in, in one season as 10 people inhale in a full year. Half of our oxygen on this planet Earth comes from trees and shrubs and grasses. The other half comes from the ocean. When we use the resources of this world in light of those who will follow us is either a selfish human thing only or a combined human and divine adventure in wise stewardship. The Okanichi Park is an example of that. Every park, state, federal park, is an example of this. A park doesn't just happen. It's a joint effort between God, our Creator, and those who came before us. It's a glorification of God, our Creator. It's a sacrificial gift from past to future generations, a divine human venture. Jesus was talking to Peter about the difference in being nearsighted and living only with human motives alone, without also considering motives that are divine. So Peter then could be farsighted, eternal in his view of life. Jesus blended the human and the divine perfectly, the nearsightedness and the farsightedness. Made in the image of Christ, we too are human and divine. In nature, we are capable of nearsightedness and farsighted, eternal love. Being nearsighted and human allowed Jesus to stop in the middle of what he was doing to be able to see human pain or injustice or illness that was in front of him. Nearsighted. Then to have compassion and minister with philos and agape love. Teaching Peter today was an act of far-sighted divine love, agape, a divine gift that has, has lasted throughout the centuries to this very day. When we do give ourselves with sacrificial, self-giving agape love, like the trees around us give themselves for us to live. We're doing a human divine thing. Giving a gift for the sake of the future, our future, and that of generations to come. It's a human selfish thing to live for the moment and think nothing of those who will come after us. To want to protect and hold on to what we love as Peter did. It's a very human thing to consider with anxiety and sometimes fear the short span of life we have to live our lives. And it is an all too human thing to avoid thinking about where we will be when we cease to exist, when we die. Jesus offers us a wonderful choice. We can join our human nature with our divine nature as he did, giving our lives sacrificially. Jesus was simply preparing his friends who he loved 
for his death and telling them that his death and resurrection was a spiritual divine thing. A gift for them and the world for all generations to come. Yet before that spiritual gift giving, it would be preceded by a very costly and painful human experience leading to the death. It's divine for us to live our lives giving agape, self-giving, love to each other. We share this planet with today and those who will follow us generations from now we don't know. Like my newest grandson who is yet to be born, those unknown people and their families will inherit how we have lived self-giving lives. We love them even though we don't know them. Those who created all the parks in the country and in the world have done the same. They loved us with agape love even though they did not know us. We've chosen as followers of Jesus to be in a self-giving partnership for the future with God. To the glory of Christ our Lord and Redeemer, God our Creator and Holy Spirit who gives us every divine breath of life. Amen.